Hey, welcome back. Uh, it's Mike Jones again. You remember me? So last time I ended with the slideshow that you, uh, of, of the pictures from your textbook. And remember, I told you that I liked your slideshow and I like the pictures better. And I like the ideas and the concepts better. That was for the first half of chapter two. This is the second half of chapter two. So we're going back to the, uh, the slideshow that I had originally put on, um, our Blackboard page. So yes, we're coming back to this one, the holes anatomy, but it's the same stuff. I mean, the concepts are the same. The ideas are the same. Anatomy and physiology just doesn't change very, very much. And it's certainly at this level. Um, yes, there are new ideas of anatomy and physiology that are added. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that has just been added just in the past probably five to ten years is that we have identified the lymphatic drainage system for the brain, which we didn't really understand before, which seems kind of crazy. How did we not know that? But, but that's true. But that's beyond where you're at right now. <clears throat> I like the second half of this slideshow in this chapter and, and how they describe it. So what I want to do is I want to re, uh, recap using this slideshow what you already know, which means I'm going to go fast. Of course, I need my laser pointer. You know that. So laser pointer. Boom. There it is. Great. All right. Let's move forward. Chemistry. We've been talking about chemistry the whole time here, right? Um, that's the level below or the, under, the, the level of understanding, the level of knowledge, knowledge that we're getting into below the level of physiology. We have to understand chemistry. If you understand the chemistry at least a little bit, you'll understand the physiology so much easier. So this is a description of chemistry, why it's important. Great, we move on. Structure of matter, we've already been through this. Matter, anything that takes up space and has mass, right? Composed of atoms. Elements are the simplest types of matter, and atoms are the smallest particles of those elements. Um, we talk about bulk elements. That means, you know, the table that I showed you in the last slideshow. Uh, what you're made up of mostly. Most of the stuff you're made of. Oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. Uh, the elements that are listed here. Right? Nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. Those are what you're made up mostly. There are trace elements. That doesn't mean that they're not important. They're just in smaller quantities. Iron and iodine. And ultra trace elements. Even tinier, tinier amounts. Again, it doesn't mean they're not important. It just means they're small, tiny amounts that are important in those small, tiny amounts. Right? So, arsenic, oddly enough, arsenic is generally considered a poison. But yes, some of you is arsenic on a tiny, tiny amount, and you need it. So it's not a poison. What you're going to learn about poisons, this term poison, uh, is it's all, uh, it corresponds to what we call dose dependency. This is true for any poison. Uh, the classic example is botulinum toxin. Botulinum toxin is a toxin expressed by a bacteria. And that bacteria killed hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people in the Middle Ages. In the 1500s, 1600s, killed tons and tons and tons and tons of people. Lots of your relatives many, many, many generations back. It turns out that we use it today to reduce wrinkles and to make you look lovely. It's called Botox. So it's a dose-dependent a dose phenomena. If you inject a lot of botulinum toxin, into your body, you die. If you inject a tiny, tiny, tiny nanogram quantities into your forehead, you don't have wrinkles anymore. It's a weird thing to think of, but that, that ascribes to the whole idea of dose dependency. Here they are again. You've already seen a table like this, right? Last time we were out. The things that you're made of mostly and the things that you're less made of. Again, I'll reiterate, doesn't mean that they're not important if they're in lesser quantity. It just means they're lesser quantity. We've already been through this. You know what an atom is. An atom is 
composed of these subatomic particles. So, meaning an atom is composed of subatomic particles, something below the level of an atom. Neutrons, protons, electrons. Don't tell your local physicist, they'll laugh at you. Um, but that's all we care about. Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Electrons are flying around the outside of the nucleus. Here's our handy dandy chart. Capitulates all of the things that you need to know about an atom, an electron, a proton, a neutron. What's an ion? Remember, an atom, an atom by definition, I'm going to reiterate this, you're going to see this on a test. By definition, an atom has a neutral charge. It does not have a positive charge, it doesn't have a negative charge. If that atom has a negative charge or a positive charge, it is called an ion. And molecules are simply combinations of atoms put together and connected together by what we call bonds. Those bonds can be ionic bonds or they can be covalent bonds. Uh, remember, well, we'll get to that. We're gonna. So, an atomic number, how many protons are there in the nucleus? That is the atomic number of that element. Atomic weight, the atomic weight is the combination of the number of protons in the nucleus and the number of neutrons in the nucleus. That's its atomic weight. That's because those are the things that have mass um, in an atom. Yes, there are electrons. Yes, you need electrons. But they're flying around and they, they barely weigh anything. They do weigh something, but so small, so tiny, and they're so far away from the nucleus. They don't, they don't really, I say really, as a, as a physiologist, they don't really add to the weight of an atom. Isotopes, isotopes are the same atom because you have the same number of protons and you have the same number of electrons. But isotopes are different numbers of neutrons inside the nucleus and a and different number of neutrons means that atom is unstable. Unstable meaning it's radioactive. So it gives off some sort of radiation. And radiation means that we can measure that along what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. These are physiologically useful ideas because we can have, we can measure. So this is a good example here. Oxygen forms isotopes. O16 is normal. That's normal oxygen. That's what you think of as oxygen. But it can have an extra neutron or it can have two extra neutrons. And we call it O17 or O18. Uh, that adds to its radioactive instability, but we can measure that using uh, a, say, for example, a PET scan, a positron emission tomography scan. Doesn't matter what that is at this point, it just means that we can measure these radioactive elements and we can see what's going on inside a body based on these isotopes. Remember, a molecule is an atom here, an atom here. They get together. How do they get together? Well, they can get together. They can, one atom can take an electron from another one, and we call that an ionic bond. Or they can share electrons. If they share them, we call that a covalent bond. But if they get together, they're no longer atoms. Now they're called compounds or molecules. And then we have to uh, depict them or the, we have to show them on paper with what we call molecular formulas. Right, so H2 is a molecule of hydrogen. That means two atoms of hydrogen got together. They share a pair of electrons. Since they share the pair of electrons, now it's H and H. We call it H2. That's, that's hydrogen, the molecule. Hydrogen molecule is a gas. C6H2O6, that's a molecule of glucose. There are other sugars that have that same molecular formula, uh, but if we consider it a molecule of glu glucose, glucose is a sugar. 
extremely important. We're going to see how important this thing is. And then H2O, you're familiar with this, a molecule of water. An O in the center and a hydrogen and a hydrogen off of one side and off the other side. But remember, we talked last time about how those hydrogens are not straight out to either side, but they're at a slight angle away from the oxygen. And that gives them very special characteristics. All right, so here is a molecule of hydrogen, H2. Here's a molecule of oxygen, O2. Right, you breathe this stuff in all the time. Uh, you need it all the time, forever and ever and ever. If we put them together in a special way and under special circumstances, they will combine together and they form what we call water, H2O. Two H's, one O. They're off at a slightly jaunty angle here, and that gives them special characteristics. But this is called a molecule of water. Right, atoms bond together. They can either take an electron from one other atom, or they can share electrons from another atom. Those atoms, or those, those electrons, sorry, those electrons are in what we call shells. Remember, the first shell is closest to the nucleus. That can hold, at most, two electrons. The next shell out can hold eight electrons. And and remember, we, we I, I mentioned that we want to anthropomorphize. That means we want to make it human, in a sense. We want to imagine that this shell uh, has a desire, right? And the shell that can hold eight electrons wants to hold eight electrons. You imagine it with, you know, some sort of psychological desire. Oh, I wish I had eight electrons. Or if it only has one electron out there, oh, I wish I didn't have that one electron. I wish I could get rid of it. There are ways to do this. And that makes these atoms happy. It makes them get together. This is how they bond. Here's hydrogen. One proton, one electron, boom, hydrogen, fine. Here's helium. Two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. And here's lithium. You have three protons, four neutrons. But if you have three protons, you have to balance those out electrically with three electrons. There you go. And on and on and on it goes. It goes on and on and on through the periodic table. All right, here's how they bond. Now, this first one is called ions, right? So ions, I better move me. Also, I want to remind you at this point, when it says, in this, in this particular slideshow, when it says figure 2.4a, that's referring to the other textbook. Don't look for this in your textbook, but you do have a, an equivalent picture, just like this one, in your textbook. It's exactly the same. This stuff doesn't change. Right? So, an, a, an ion, an ion by definition is an atom that gains or loses an electron to become stable. And stable means it either has a full outer shell of electrons or it gives up the one electron that it may have out there, happily gives it up. Um, so it either gains one or loses one. But that means it gains a charge either in a positive direction or a negative direction. If it's positively charged, it's called a cation. Remember, you feel positive about cats. You like cats, so you feel positive about them. That makes it positive. Cations are positively charged ions. Anions are negatively charged anions. This is how batteries work. You have a cation and an anion, and electrons flow between the two plates. Doesn't matter. We're not here talking about chemistry, but that this is how batteries work. Same idea. Classic example here, of course, is sodium. You saw what the sodium, the atom, does. I showed you a video of that last time. Sodium, the atom, electrically neutral, but it wants so badly to get rid of that outer shell electron. If it has a chance to do it, it will do it, but it does it very aggressively. So aggressively that it becomes an explosive. However, once it's done, once it gets rid of it, it's sodium, the ion, 
Sodium the ion is very happy, very content, does nothing mean or vicious to anybody else. In fact, it becomes salt. Where's that electron go? The electron has energy. The electron now goes to chlorine. Remember, chlorine had seven electrons in its outer shell. That's one short of what it really, really wants to have. It wants to have eight. Once it has eight, it's happy. It's content. Everything's, ha everything's great with chlorine. So sodium chloride tastes great. Sodium by itself is explosive. Chlorine by itself will kill you. Chlorine gas, it used to be used as a, uh, 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 a bomb in World War I. It's been used since then, uh, but it is a noxious compound that will kill you. Chlorine, the ion, is friendly. It's fine. It's nothing. It's a bleach. It works in your wash. It's very happy that way. Right, so that's called an ionic bond, right? If it gives up, if one atom gives up an electron, the other one accepts the electron, now one has a positive one charge, the other has a negative one charge, they get together, that's called an ionic bond. Extremely important in physiology. Uh, the other kind of bond, well, the other kind of bond that's really important for energy purposes is what's called a covalent bond. Covalent bonds are very strong chemical bonds. They do not like to be broken, but when they are broken, they give off energy. That's going to be extremely important. When we get to metabolism, when your body needs energy to do anything, it needs to break covalent bonds and take the energy from that covalent bond to, to do something useful in your body. Eventually, we're going to call that metabolism. So. Here's a classic example. Here's hydrogen, the atom. Hydrogen, the atom. They join together. You create hydrogen, the molecule, H2. H2 shares a pair of electrons. A pair, right? Here's one, here's two. It's a pair. They share it. So between those two hydrogen atoms, they're sharing that pair of electrons. They're both very happy about it. They're both content. This is a much more stable molecule. Uh, we use hydrogen for various things, but hydrogen is a gas, and it's fairly stable all by itself. So we call that a covalent bond. Now you can share one pair of electrons, or you can share two pair of electrons. That's what oxygen does. Oxygen shares two pair of electrons. O2 shares two pair of electrons. But in order to create water, we have to break apart the oxygen molecule, and we have to break apart the hydrogen molecules, and then we have to bond these two hydrogens to that one oxygen, and these two hydrogens to that one oxygen. So that takes a little bit of energy to do that. It doesn't just happen spontaneously. You have to add a little energy in, and there are ways to do that. Your body does it. Nature does it. We can do it in a chemistry lab. But in the end, you have H2O, and these both both of these molecules are happy. They're sharing electrons. Now, this is how we show these things on paper or on <laughs> uh, on slides. Right? We say, well, here's an H. Here's a hydrogen. Here's a hydrogen. Bonds together in one single bond. When they share a pair of electrons, we call that H2. So this little stick in between the H's represents one pair of electrons. On the other hand, two oxygens get together. They share two pair of electrons. So we indicate that by putting two sticks in between them. It doesn't mean that O equals O. That's not what we're talking about in chemistry. We're saying that O and O share two pair of electrons. Over here in H2O, we say, well, this O shares a pair of electrons with that hydrogen, and it shares another pair of electrons with this oxygen. Great. And then over here, the last example, CO2. CO2 means 
The C is in the middle, and it is sharing two pair of electrons with that oxygen and two pair of electrons with that oxygen. And so we would consider this, as I said last time, we would consider this nonpolar because it has an equal distribution of electrons. Whereas, so we would say CO2 is nonpolar. We would say that O2 is nonpolar. We would say that H2 is nonpolar. These are nonpolar covalent bonds. However, H2O has polar covalent bonds, which makes water very, very special. And I told you we look for water on, on foreign planets. And if we see the indication of water, we say, aha, there might be life there. Why is that? Because water is the thing uh, that is the commonality between all life forms on Earth, H2O. And it's because of this not straight bond, but an angled bond between the, uh, the oxygen and the hydrogens. And that gives it some slight, tiny little bit of polarity. So we call this a polar covalent bond. So there it is, right? Polar molecule. Here's the oxygen, big, fat, huge, lots more subatomic particles. Hydrogen's very simple, right? So this end of it drags the, the uh, electrons toward it. It becomes slightly negative. The other side becomes slightly positive, And that creates what we call a polar covalent bond and gives water very, very important properties. It allows water molecules to hydrogen bond. That's the third kind of bond. So, re so these bonds are very important. I guarantee you, you're going to see questions about this. There are ionic bonds. There are covalent bonds of different kinds. And then the third kind of bonding is hydrogen bonds. Okay. In order of strength, physiologically, you're going to get into an argument with your chemistry professor about this. Physiologically, the strongest of these bonds is the covalent bond. Any covalent bond is very strong. Next in line, in terms of strength of bond, is ionic bonding. Ionic bonding are the next level of strength physiologically. The weakest of those three bonds, by far, is the hydrogen bond. Very, very weak, but still very important. And you're going to see this. this Third, this comment down here, um, hydrogen bonds are important for protein structure and nucleic acid structure. And we haven't even gotten to what a protein is and what a nucleic acid is. But just remember, they're important. Okay, chemical reactions. Now, we have to talk about how do these molecules react together. Right? A chemical reaction is when a chemical bond forms or breaks between an atom, an ion, or a molecule. It doesn't matter. Any of these things, when they react together, we call that a chemical reaction. You start with things that are called reactants. Whatever enters into a chemical reaction is called a reactant. That's the starting material. In the end of that chemical reaction, you get a product. You start with a reactant, you end with a product. Now, in this particular case, we're going to take sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, let's say the solid. This is salt. This is table salt, right? It's, it usually sits at most people's tables, but if you have crystal salt in your cupboard, take some out, take a little pinch of that stuff out, drop it in water. You have just uh, completed a chemical reaction. The chemical reaction is Sodium chloride, the salt, the solid, the ionic bonded solid, you drop it in water. Sodium comes apart from the chloride and they become surrounded by water molecules. Right? So in that case, that is a chemical reaction. Yes, you don't see an explosion, you don't see colors, you don't see any magnificent thing happening. It's still a chemical reaction. The sodium chloride, the solid, came apart into the products, uh, an ion of sodium and an ion of chloride. Or you could say a cation 
of sodium and an anion of chloride. That's a chemical reaction. That's what it is. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Now, this is, this is something that we didn't talk about, but we need to. What kinds of chemical reactions can take place? Well, these kinds, right? You can have, so, you can have a kind of reaction called a synthesis reaction. Synthesizing something means you're making something. You're making something bigger than, um, or more complicated than you started off with. So you start over here with the reactants, the reactants A, and you add the reactant B. When you put them together, you synthesize something that that involves A and B connected together somehow. So that's a synthesis. You're creating something that didn't exist before. All right. The opposite of that is what we call a decomposition reaction. Decomposition is you take A and B and you break it apart. So the sodium chloride reaction that you on the previous slide, when you take salt, you throw it in your water, that is a decomposition reaction. You're tearing them apart. So you take A and B and you pull them apart from each other. So you have A plus B. They're not connected anymore. So synthesis and decomposition, these are all over the place in physiology. Another thing that's all over the place in physiology is an exchange reaction. You start off with this compound, AB, and you add CD. And in this particular example, B comes away from A, but is replaced by D. And the um, so the D moves over to the A, the B moves over to the C. So now you have AD plus CB. Right? So chemical bonds are broken, but new bonds are formed. That's an exchange reaction. And then the last type here is reversible reaction, right? A plus B can go to AB. Or it can come back into A plus B depending on circumstances. Circumstances in physiology mean um, uh, highly influenced by uh, what's called pH. And pH is the measurement of acidity or alkalinity in a solution. We're going to talk about that. That's the next thing we're going to talk about. So pH really will change whether a reaction wants to go to AB or whether that reaction wants to come back to A plus B. pH, acidity, alkalinity will determine which way that, direct, that reaction goes in life, in physiology. And so, now, we have these things called acids, bases, and salts. Salts you already know about. We've talked about that. Salts are like sodium chloride. Right? They are ions that um, combine to form a particular compound. So sodium chloride, the compound, the salt <coughs> dissolved in water comes apart into sodium ion and chloride ion. These things in you may have heard of this term called electrolytes. Electrolytes are simply ions that are dissolved in water uh, that you need for living purposes, for life purposes. Right? So an electrolyte is nothing more than an ion dissolved in water. Now you need these things. So if you go out for a run on a hot day and you sweat a lot, you're losing water. But you're also losing electrolytes, and you have to replace those electrolytes. What do, what do we mean by electrolytes? We mean you have to replace the sodium that you lost through sweating. We have to replace the chloride that you lost through, and the potassium that you lost through sweating. You lose these electrolytes. Well, you got to get them back again. Now, so those are salts. Uh, we're going to talk about acids and bases. So acids... There's a, there's a scale that we measure whether something is an acid or whether something is a base. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. 
but acids and bases work a lot like salts do. It's just that they have one more thing to them, one more uh, one more uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Hmm, I forget. One more condition, I guess, that they or, or or consequence that they add to physiology. And that is this thing right here. Either either an H plus ion is considered an acid that adds to the acidity of a solution and that changes how things work in the body a little bit of acid is okay too much acid uh, that can result in pain muscle cramping or even death too much acid on the other hand too much base uh, if 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 things are too basic in the body the same things can happen it can add to either an uncomfortable feeling pain or death so acids and bases are a special form of, of salts or electrolytes that have a great influence on how physiology continues so we now we're going to talk about acids and bases okay but acids and bases and salts work very much the same way right you have sodium chloride the crystal we were to talk about this you take sodium chloride table salt you throw it into water okay it comes apart into the sodium ion and the chloride ion. Same thing with hydrochloric acid, that's HCl. HCl, when thrown into water, comes apart into H plus and Cl minus. But the H plus has special properties now. It does a special thing. We're going to talk about that in a minute. All right. So we have to talk about acids and bases. Acids and bases are extremely, extremely, uh, how many extremely is going to use? Uh, extremely important in physiology. Your blood, the pH of your blood is maintained between a pH. And we're, I'll, I'll tell you what the P, what this, what this measurement means, but a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. That's it. 0.1 of a pH unit. Now you don't even know what that means yet. But that little tiny window, if it's breached too far one way or too far the other way, you die. Do I have your attention now? Right. If you have a pH of say 6.8, 6.6, you're going to die. I mean your blood. If your blood has a pH of say 7.8, 7. maybe 7.9, 8.0, you're going to die if it stays there. That's how uh, uh, that's how close, how narrow that range of pH must be maintained. So this would be called homeostasis as well. There's a homeostatic mechanism that regulates the pH of your blood. And that is the acidity or basicity of your blood from 7.35 to 7.45. That is normal. If it's outside of that, it's not normal. So what the heck is pH? pH is a measurement of H plus ions. Okay, so if you have a lot of H plus ions, your the solution that you're measuring, let's let's not say it's blood. Let's say the solution that you're measuring. If it has a lot of H plus ions, it is a very acidic solution. Okay? So, for example, acetic acid. You have it at home. If you have acetic acid, there is a lot of H plus ion in acetic acid. Um, that being the case, you would expect that that solution has a high acidity. And you'd be correct. Now, the trouble here is that the, the understanding is you can say, well, I have a lot of H plus ion in my acetic acid. Yes, that's true. However, the way the pH is measured on the scale of pH measurement, and as it says here, the pH scale, the pH scale measures the H plus ion concentration. Great. The more H plus ion you have, 
the more acid that solution is. Great, that's easy to understand. However, the pH scale is the opposite of what you would expect. The lower the number, the higher the pH, the higher the acidity. What? What the heck? This is bizarre. It has to do with mathematics. How we measure things mathematically. I don't want to get into the mathematics. What we mean is the more H plus there is, the more acidic it is, but the lower the number on the pH scale. So that same acetic acid that has a high acidity also has a pH on the pH scale of about three or four. The pH scale itself goes from zero to 14. A low of zero to a high of 14. The lower that number, the more acid the solution is. The higher the number, the more basic, or you also see this term, alkaline. A-L-K-A-L-I-N-E. Alkaline. So the more alkaline it is, or the more basic it is, the higher the pH. The number in the pH scale will go higher. The more acid it is, the pH scale goes lower. It's a mathematical, weird, nightmare thing. I don't want to get into it. But you have to wrap your head around this idea. Right, so if the H plus ion concentration is fairly high, and this is a fairly high concentration of hydrogen ions, if you have 0 0.01 grams per liter of hydrogen ion, that's a lot, the pH of that solution will be 2. And you say, well, that's a low number. Yes, it's acid. On the other hand, if the hydrogen ion concentration is 0.00000000000 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 grams per liter, which is very, very, very little, the pH of that solution is 9. So we would consider this an alkaline solution. We would consider this an acidic solution. This pH right there, that's the pH in your stomach. You have a pH of 2 in your stomach. It's very, very acid. So pH scale runs from 0 to 14. Each number represents a 10-fold difference 10 times. So this solution here that has a pH of 2, that means it has 0 0.01 grams per liter of H plus ion concentration in that solution, right? If we uh, added water to this solution and made it 0 0.001 grams per liter, the pH of that solution would be 3. We have just diluted it with water. We've made it weaker. If we make it weaker, weaker on an acidity scale, that means that the pH of the solution goes up. It is less acid. So if it's a zero, it's a extremely acidic. This is very, very acidic. This kind of a pH of zero would kill you within minutes. It's so acidic. It, it will, uh, if you ever saw the movie Alien, I don't know how many out there did, but this alien creature has very, very acidic blood, I guess. I don't know what you call it. Some sort of substance inside it. It's very, very acidic. It burns through everything. Whether you buy that or not. But you should, so now, go watch the movie Alien. Go to the part of the movie where the alien, where they cut the alien open and its blood leaks out or whatever's inside it leaks out and it, it starts to burn through the ship. I'll wait. <laughs> okay. You've seen it now. That's a very acidic solution. On the other hand, if it's the other way, it's called a basic solution. All right. Zero to 14. Zero is very acidic. 14 is very basic. Right. Acids have a pH of less than 7. Bases have a pH of greater than 7. What does that mean? That means the pH of 7 is neutral. 7 is right in the middle. Pure water. Pure H2O. I mean without any other additives to it. Pure water. Distilled water. Go to the store. Buy some distilled water. Pour it in a glass. That has a pH of 7.0.
that is neutral. If it has anything in it, it will change the pH a tiny little bit one way or the other, depending on what you put in it. All right, so I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but acids and bases are so incredibly important and so misunderstood in physiology. It's, uh, it's incredible how much this is misunderstood. All right, now, pH is a measurement of the hydrogen ion concentration. If the hydrogen ion concentration is very high, there is a lot of hydrogen ions in a liter of water. When we say per liter, we mean inside water, right? We dump a, we bunch some hydrogen ions. They're going to be connected to something else. They're going to be connected to a chloride. So we call that hydrochloric acid. Or there's, a, you know, a nitric acid. There are lots of different kinds of acids where an H plus is bound to something else. If we put it in water, if the concentration of hydrogen ions is 0.1 grams per liter of water, that has a pH of 1. If it is 0.01, it has a pH of 2, 0.001. So what you have to do is move the decimal point, right? Oh, it's 3. If I move the decimal point, 1, 2, 3. That's a pH of 3. If I move it 1, 2, 3, 4, that's a pH of 4. We're getting more basic, or we're moving toward an alkaline solution. This is considered, by definition, this is neutral. pH of 7.0 is neither acidic or basic. It is right in the center of the scale. It is not an acid. It is not a base. It is neutral. Anything above Anything higher than 7 is considered alkaline or basic. Anything lower than 7 is considered acidic. That's it. That's how a pH scale works. Now, here are some common things that you know about and the pH that they have. All right, Distilled water. I already told you that. Distilled water has a pH of 7.0 because it is pure H2O and nothing else. All right, cow's milk, right? The milk that's in your fridge has a pH of 6.6. .6. Very, very slightly acidic. You wouldn't notice that. However, if you were to drink tomato juice or apple juice, you're going to notice there's a tartness to it. That's what we call it. We call it tart. A tartness means it's acidic. Now, your stomach gastric juice, we'll get to that, or you'll get to that in AP2. Gastric juice has a pH of 2. I already told you about that. Very acidic. This is really, really good for breaking down proteins, for chewing them up, ripping them apart into their component pieces. On the other hand, let's go the other way. Human blood, 7.4, right? Remember I told you it's between 7.35 and 7.45. So 7.4 is right in the middle of that. Your blood is very slightly basic, very tiny, very slightly basic. Now, egg whites are even more basic. Sodium bicarbonate is more basic. Or alkaline, we would say it's alkaline. Milk of magnesia, if you've ever had digestive issues, you'd take milk of magnesia. You can buy it at the store, go to the pharmacy, you can find milk of magnesia. It has a pH of 10.5. It's very basic. Ammonia is even more basic, or alkaline, we would say. So, here's a scale, all right? Acid base concentration, I've already told you, the normal range of blood is 7.35 to 7.45. It must be maintained. If that range of pH in your blood changes significantly, if it goes below that, if it becomes more acid, we call it acidosis. Blood pH drops to 7.0 to 7.3. Great. So what? You have acid blood. Big deal. Here are the subjective things that happen. This person will feel disoriented. They'll feel fatigued. They'll feel tired. Uh, one of the causes is vomiting of the alkaline intestinal contents or diabetes or a lung disease with impaired CO2 exhalation. If you can't get rid of the CO2 that you are accumulating, you will become acidotic. 
On the other hand, if your blood pH rises 7.5 to 7.8, you're going to feel dizzy. You're going to feel very agitated. Now, what causes this kind of stuff? High altitudes, right? High altitudes, you have less O2. You can't get enough O2, and so you start to build up CO2. That would create an acidotic situation. On the other hand, um, right, high altitude breathing, where you're not getting enough O2, um, and you're not creating enough CO2 because you're not getting enough oxygen. We'll get to those metabolic issues. If you're vomiting the acidic contents of the stomach, which I've already told you are very acidic, you have a high fever or you're taking a lot of antacids. You have, you ate something, you ate some, you know, some tacos and they had a lot of, um, salsa on them that was very, very, uh, uh spicy. And you're like, ooh, gosh, I got an upset stomach. And you take a whole bottle of antacids. Don't, you know, you would never do that. But excess antacids neutralizes the stomach acid, and you're going to find out that that will have an effect on the whole body pH. Now, your body wants to maintain 7.35 to 7.45, so it is going to try desperately to maintain the pH between those ranges. Um, how does it do that? Your body has chemicals that are known as buffers. Buffers maintain pH, the design of a buffer, is to, is to, is to buffer excess acid or excess base that you may eat or may be created someplace in your body. A buffer is there to do exactly that, to buffer the impact of that uh, acid or base. These are chemicals which act to resist pH changes. You want to keep it here. Buffers are going to try to keep it there. All right. Now, we kind of switch gears a little bit now. The gear switch that happens here is now we're going to talk about the chemicals that are inside of cells or the chemicals that form cells. We can break it down into a, the big picture here of chemicals that that form cells. The two big uh, categories of chemicals are organic molecules versus inorganic molecules. Now, stop thinking about this as as um, the food you eat. This isn't about the food you eat. Oh, I'm eating organic food. That's great. Great. Fine. Continue to eat organic food if that's important to you. Wonderful. This is not that. This is chemistry. Chemistry is talking about organic molecules versus inorganic molecules. Now, not surprisingly, you are composed mostly of organic molecules. That's good. You would consider yourself organic. I'm natural. Yeah. Um, well, organic molecules, by definition of chemistry, chemistry says organic molecules contain a lot of carbon and a lot of hydrogen. Let's say So if a molecule has carbon in it and it has hydrogen in it, it is most likely to be an organic molecule. These things, uh, these chemicals will dissolve in water or organic liquids. Water-soluble organic compounds do not release ions and are not electrolytes. So anything that contains carbon and hydrogen typically will not release an electrolyte. Now, you already know you need electrolytes to live. You need sodium ions. You need potassium ions. You need chloride ions. You need those ions, but they're not organic. You still need them, but they're not organic because they don't contain carbon and they don't contain hydrogen. The things that you can get energy from, and these, write this down, I'm telling you, star it, uh, put an asterisk by it, highlight, whatever you need to do. These are the four things, and I mean the only, did I say that? Yes, the only four things that you can get calories from, and calories are energy for your body. You cannot get calories from any other molecules. 
That means everything you eat is either organic or inorganic. There's no other choice. Four of the things that you eat, you can get energy from, and you need energy to live. You also need inorganic compounds, inorganic molecules, but you don't get energy from them. You get something else from those inorganic molecules. So, beat a dead horse here. The four things, these are the four, write them down. Carbohydrates, right? There's one, carbohydrates. Number two, proteins. These are in no specific order, doesn't matter. Number three, lipids. When you see the word lipid, think fat. Number four, nucleic acids. Everything you eat that you can get energy from falls into one of those four categories. Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. That's it. That's nutrition in a nutshell. The other side of nutrition is the things you don't get energy from, but you need them anyway. These are inorganic molecules. They often don't contain carbon and hydrogen. They dissolve in water. They dissociate. Table salt's a good example. Sodium and chloride, right? Those are both inorganic, but you need them. You need both of those, those things. We would put water. What? Water's inorganic? How can that be? Yeah, you, you may be all natural and eat an organic diet and you say, oh, water's organic. Not chemically, it's not. Chemically, it is inorganic. Water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, inorganic salts. You need those things, but we chemically we consider them inorganic. All right, so we're going to break down the inorganic substances. All right, water. We already talked a lot about water. Here's all the characteristics of water. What does water do? It does all these things. Learn these things. Understand them. Understand why it's important. Water is the single most important thing that you can ingest <clears throat> it by itself it will not keep you alive if you drank only water i give you two or three weeks you're going to be dead i mean i don't i'm not that's not a challenge don't get me wrong here i'm not challenging you to do that i'm just saying if you drink water that's good that's not enough all right so that's what water does oxygen you need oxygen. Of course you need oxygen. You know that. you got to breathe. That's why you breathe. So organelles use it. Mitochondria in particular, but we'll get to that. Necessary for survival survival of aerobic creatures. Multicellular creatures require oxygen on this planet. We don't know about other planets. Here, because that's what you're studying, right? You're studying stuff on this planet, about humans on this planet. Got to have oxygen. Carbon dioxide is a waste product that's produced in an aerobic environment. An aerobic pr production of energy results in the waste product called carbon dioxide. You must get rid of it. And then uh, inorganic salts. These are also inorganic, of course. Sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium. On and on and on. We've already been through that. You know. These are things that control H2O concentration, pH, blood clotting, nerve and muscle processes. Electrolyte balance exists when gains equal losses. So if you go out for a run, you're going to lose sodium. You're going to lose chloride. You're going to lose potassium through your sweat. you got to get it back. You will get it back. You'll drink an electrolyte beverage, or you'll just drink water, and then you'll go eat a taco, and the taco is going to have all this other stuff in it. Can you tell I like Mexican food? So... Now, the other side, chemistry says you have organic substances. Uh, organic substances have carbon and hydrogen in them. They often also have oxygen in them, but not all the time. Number one, carbohydrates. Okay, The main source of cellular energy. You have glucose floating around your blood, a fairly high concentration of glucose in your blood all the time. Right. Carbohydrates are water soluble. They contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. The ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is close to two to one, almost all the time. So, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, you're going to see more, usually twice as many hydrogens as you see carbons and oxygens. That's not an absolute guarantee, but it's 
It's pretty good. It's pretty close. Now, carbohydrates come in three forms. Uh, they can be by themselves, and, and a molecule of a carbohydrate, we'll say a molecule of glucose, which is a very specific carbohydrate, one molecule of glucose is called a monosaccharide. So just look at this word, mono. Mono means one. Now, disaccharide means you have one molecule of a carbohydrate and another molecule hooked together. Now you got two of them. If you have two, that's a di. A disaccharide is a double sugar. Examples of that are sucrose and lactose. Sucrose is table sugar. This is what you have at your table. It's a disaccharide. Who knew? Now you know. Or you can link those uh, monosaccharides one after another into a big long chain, or they can have branching chains, they can have weird looking things. That is called a polysaccharide. So uh, you're going to want to get used to these terminology. Mono means one, di means two, poly means many. At least more than two. <laughs> it doesn't tell you how many, it just says more than two, they're all linked together into a long chain. Right? So here's a picture. So this is glucose drawn out in its molecular formula. You know, all the carbons and oxygens and hydrogens, blah, 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 all this stuff. All right, so there it is, all drawn out. This is what it looks like most of the time in your bloodstream. It looks like this kind of circular thing or connected together, right? This six-sided chain with these other chains sticking off the sides. We don't like to draw those. It takes too long to draw them. What you see in the pictures, and you're going to see this from now on, what you're going to see in the pictures is this. This is glucose. And you'll say, well, it's a, it's a little hexagon with an oxygen at one corner. Yep, that's how we're going to draw it. That's a sugar. you got to get used to that terminology or the used to the, the visual of that so that it doesn't confuse you and you don't get left behind here. Because here we go. Here's a monosaccharide. Now, I, I can't tell you that this is glucose. I can only tell you this is a monosaccharide. It is one single sugar molecule. If I hook this sugar molecule to another, I get a disaccharide, two of them. If I hook it to a lot of others, I get a polysaccharide. So polysaccharides don't mean that it's in one long chain. It means there can be some branching. So a polysaccharide. This is how these single monosaccharides are stored in your body. Your liver has a bunch of this stuff sitting inside it. It's a, it's a nice uh, concentrated storage form of sugars. So now we move on. The next thing, lipids. Remember I told you the word lipid. When you see the word lipid, think fat. Um, or you could think of oil, if you like. Fat would be something like, would be a solid at room temperature, and an oil would be a liquid at room temperature. You're used to that. Either way, it doesn't matter. They're insoluble in water. You already know that. Water and oil doesn't mix. Neither does water and fat. Neither does water and lipids. They don't mix. So they are insoluble in water. But they're soluble in organic solvents. Well, that's great. So go ahead and you drink some, uh, you know, some uh, lighter fluid, which is organic. Or you could drink some mineral spirits, which is a paint thinner. Don't do that. Bad for you. <laughs> All right, so lipids include these things called triglycerides, which are called fats, phospholipids, and steroids. Steroids, extremely important that you understand that a steroid is a lipid. That means it is fat-soluble. Fat-soluble, not water-soluble. Have I emphasized that enough? Mm -hmm. Important component of cell membranes. All these things are important components of cell membranes. That means a cell membrane is composed mostly of fatty stuff, of lipids. So it's an oily substance uh, on the outside of a cell. That means that things that are soluble inside a cell membrane are going to be fat-soluble things, like steroids. But things that are not fat-soluble, that are water-soluble, cannot get through a cell membrane. I am going to beat that into your brains in the next section, in the next 
the next lecture. Things that get through, let me say it one more time, things that get through cell membranes are fat soluble. The only other way to get through a cell membrane is that molecule has to be invited in or escorted in. It cannot get in by itself. If it is fat soluble, it can slide right through the cell membrane like it wasn't even there. If it is water soluble, it cannot get into the cell membrane unless it is invited in or allowed to go in by some other mechanism. You're going to see what I mean. All right. You should remember that when we get to the next chapter. I'm going to beat that into your heads. All right. So triglycerides are fats, right? Butter. Butter is a triglyceride. They have a lot of energy in them. Uh, they contain more energy per gram than carbohydrates, meaning if you eat the equivalent amount of fat, if you were to take a gram of carbohydrate, a spoonful of sugar, and a spoonful of fat, butter, you're going to get more energy from the spoonful of fat. All right? They contain carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, but usually less oxygen, and usually one molecule of glycerol and three fatty acids. The glycerol kind of combines them all together. All right, so we're moving on. Here's a lipid, right? A saturated fatty acid means, saturated means, carbon, 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 hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. All of the carbons are attached to another hydrogen, and they or another carbon, and they are attached to hydrogens around the outside. There are no double bonds. There are no funny, there's no funny business here. This is called a saturated fatty acid. This would be a solid at room temperature. Butter is a good example. Butter is mostly a saturated fatty acid. On the other hand, unsaturated fatty acids have, you know, this C, carbon, 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 but this carbon is double bonded to that carbon. So there's a little bit of a change in its conformation, the way it looks. Anyway, this thing is more likely to be a liquid at room temperature, like olive oil or, you know, any kind of vegetable oil. It's going to be like this. And because of the way that it's built, uh, it's going to be a liquid at room temperature. So saturated fatty acids tend to be solids. Unsaturated fatty acids tend to be liquids at room temperature. And here's a big, long chain. This is called a glycerol portion. This molecule right here, it doesn't matter. This is called a triglyceride. This thing is glycerol. You have three fatty acid chains connected to the glycerol. Uh, that's called a, uh, a triglyceride. You eat these all the time. As I say, vegetable oil, olive oil, canola oil, I don't care, coconut oil, whatever oil that you are eating in your food. They're triglycerides. Um, now, these fatty acids can be any different kind, any different length, any different shape attached to the glycerol. And that's what makes them different. One, coconut oil is different than canola oil is different than palm kernel oil is different than uh, olive oil, right? These, they're all a little bit different. But they're still all triglycerides. Now, I've already shown you a triglyceride has the glycerol portion here, and then it has three fatty acid chains connected to it, of whatever they're, whatever they look like. Great. That's a triglyceride. Inside all of the cell membranes in your body, and I mean every cell membrane that you have, you have what are called phospholipids. Phospholipids have a little phosphate group here that attaches, this whole thing is considered a phosphate group, so instead of three fatty acids, you have two fatty acids onto the glycerol and a phosphate group that's also attached to that glycerol. That is called a phospholipid that is part of uh, membranes. Cell membranes are composed of this. We don't like to draw this stuff out. I told you already chemically. We don't like to draw these things out. We draw them out like this. We put the little phosphate head group at one end and we draw the tails the fatty acid tails hanging off of that. 
So this is how you're going to see cell membranes drawn. Lots and lots and lots of these things all strung together into one big long chain. You'll see what I mean. Next up, lipids, steroids. These are steroids. This is a steroid. Steroids are always uh, derivatives of cholesterol. Cholesterol is the main steroid now. We used to tell you that cholesterol is bad. Don't eat cholesterol. It's bad for you. And it turns out that that's only maybe a quarter true. <laughs> if you, it's certainly true. If you eat too much cholesterol, uh, that won't be good for you. However, it turns out that you need a lot of cholesterol, and you can make your own cholesterol if you don't have enough cholesterol. All right, so here's cholesterol. All of the uh, steroid hormones are based off of cholesterol. So what does that mean? Adrenal hormones are steroid hormones. Sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, they are steroid hormones. They're, ba they're built from steroids. They're built from cholesterol, which is fat soluble. All right, moving on to proteins. Proteins are long chains of a substance. The monomer, the base subunit of protein, is called uh, an amino acid. An amino acid has a particular structure. This is an amino acid, the gen generic form of amino acid. You have 20 different amino acids that you use as a human being to make all of the proteins in your body, all the different kinds of proteins that you have that all have all kinds of different uh, unique attributes and unique functions. You make them all from 20 different kinds of amino acids. So this is your generic generalized amino acid. If we put them together, well, this is a particular amino acid called cysteine. Here's another particular amino acid called phenyl phenylalanine. Um, it doesn't matter what these side groups are. They're still amino acids. If we string them together, we create proteins. So amino acid is the monomer, the single individual unit. If we string them together, we create a protein. Or another word for it is a polypeptide. This is an amino acid. Here's one amino acid here. There's a second amino acid. Chemically, we've already put them together in this picture. They're already together. This would be a synthesis reaction. In the synthesis reaction, you take an amino acid on the left side, an amino acid on the right side, and we put them together, and we take away a molecule of water. This is called a synthesis reaction. Now I have two amino acids. So this would be a dipeptide. Now I can string them together, one amino acid after another. So all of these little boxes here that have different colors, every one of them is an amino acid. Amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Dozens and dozens and dozens strung together like a string of pearls. String them all together, you have what we call a polypeptide, or often called a protein. Now, proteins come, the way that we categorize proteins is different proteins have different attributes. Those attributes come from the amino acid sequence. If the amino acid sequence is different from one polypeptide to the next polypeptide, they're going to have a different structure, they're going to have a different function, they're going to do different things in your body. It all depends on the amino acid sequence. If it changes, even by one or two or three amino acids, the function of that protein changes dramatically from its original. Small changes in proteins mean big changes physiologically. So these are the, just the different ways that proteins, what we call the primary structure, is the amino acid sequence. One amino acid after another. On and on and on and on and on. So insulin is a good example, right? Insulin, one molecule of insulin has the same amino acid sequence as another molecule of insulin. 
if they're exactly the same, they will have the same function. And they'll have the same function because they will fold up in a particular way because of this amino acid sequence, and they will have what we call a unique three-dimensional shape. So this is why we get into this when we start talking about proteins and we start talking about them interacting with, with say, something like a cell membrane. We call that a lock and key model. If a protein has a particular shape because of its amino acid sequence, it will do a particular thing and it will interact with the lock, if you will, in a very specific way. And that all comes down to its amino acid sequence. If you change the amino acid sequence, you change the shape of the protein, and now that key no longer fits in the lock. And we got a problem. All right, last one. The last thing you can get, the organic substance you can get calories from, are called nucleic acids. And I'm going to go through this pretty quick. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. That's what DNA stands for. It is, your, you've heard about this, it's called the genetic code. It carries the genetic code. It is found in the nucleus of a cell. Always. In mammalian cells, DNA is always in the nucleus. Uh, the only time that is not true is when that cell is dividing. We'll talk about when that happens. Otherwise, its home is the nucleus. It's great, it carries genetic instructions, that's wonderful. But it also is the guide for uh, protein synthesis. So in order to make a protein in your body, your DNA codes for that in a very special way, and it tells uh, the cell mechanisms how to make that specific protein. What does that mean? That means it tells the machinery which amino acid to put next to what other amino acid. And remember I just told you, if that sequence is the same all the time, then that protein will have the same function as the protein that was made a second before that, or a second before that, or a year before that. The insulin that you are making today has the same shape and the same function and the same amino acid sequence as the insulin that you made one year ago. And you hope, please, oh, please, oh, please, that it maintains that same amino acid sequence a year from now. It's got to be the same to function the same. And that's what DNA is for. Now, there's another kind of nucleic acid called RNA. Now, we're going to hit this. I'm going to tell you all about uh, the virus that causes the disease COVID-19, right? This novel coronavirus, it is an RNA virus. We'll, we'll get into that some other time. But RNA is very similar to DNA. The structure of a nucleotide is the single solitary unit, or what we'd call the monomer of DNA, is this structure. S means you have a sugar. There's a sugar in here. Off of one side of that sugar is a phosphate group. Off the other side of that sugar is attached a base, what we call a base, an organic base. So in the center is a sugar, on one side is a phosphate group, and the other side is an organic base. That is a nucleic acid. That is the general generic structure of a nucleic acid. This is an organic molecule. Yes, you can eat, if you eat, if you had a salad for lunch and you ate lettuce, inside the cells of that lettuce leaf is that the lettuce cell DNA. Within that DNA, it has uh, a, nucle a nucleotide, or what is called a nucleic acid, that nucleic acid has this identifiable chemical signature. You're going to bust this thing apart, and you're going to get energy from this thing. If you ate a hamburger, same thing. The muscle cells of the burger have, nu have a nucleus. Inside the nucleus is nucleic acid. You're going to break it down. You're going to turn it into energy. That's why you eat this stuff. 
Doesn't matter what you eat. You're going to turn it into energy. This is how DNA is uh, put together. We usually call it DNA is usually found double stranded. Double stranded means these phosphates and sugars form what we call a phosphate, or we, we call this the backbone. We call it the phosphate backbone. So it's a phosphate and a sugar and a phosphate and a sugar and a phosphate and a sugar and a phosphate and a sugar. And you get it, right? I'm, I'm just wasting my breath here. That forms what we call the backbone, kind of the backbone of a ladder. But on the inside, the rungs of a ladder are the bases. And these bases on one side of the ladder pair up with a particular base on the other side of the ladder. We're going to talk about this specificity. But this is DNA. This is in the nucleus. DNA. Double stranded deoxyribonucleic acid. In the case of RNA, RNA is often found single stranded. One single strand. It can be very, very long. Single strand of RNA. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. So it's slightly different structure than deoxyribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid, deoxyribonucleic acid. But they're very similar in other ways. These are nucleic acids. All right. Here's the properties. DNA stores in genetic code. Contains the sugar deoxyribose. Ribonucleic acid contains the sugar ribose. That's where it gets its name from. Usually DNA is double-stranded, double helix, we call it. RNA is usually single-stranded, still composed of nucleotides, strung together. So that's it for organic stuff, right? So that's it for organic molecules, pH, uh, atoms, molecules, bonding theory, uh, all of these things that you need to know about in order to really understand physiology. And I, 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 I don't want you to get too bogged down in the details of this, but you need to understand certain aspects of this to understand the next aspect. When we get to physiology, I'm going to say uh, this has an uh, acidic uh, group, and that's going to lower the pH of the blood, and that's going to change the enzymatic profile. And you're going to go, what? You need to understand this stuff in order to understand the next step in the process. All right, so as it, uh, to encapsulate, we went through atoms, subatomic particles, atoms. When atoms lose or gain electrons, they, they, call, they form ions. Ions can bond together within ionic bonds, or atoms themselves can share electrons called covalent bonds. But they're going to get together. They've got to get together. What do they build? They build these structures that are called carbohydrates. Uh, fats, lipids, uh, proteins through stringing amino acids together, and nucleic acids. You need to understand the subunits of these things. Uh, nucleic acids, uh, carbohydrates, and proteins all have what we call a monomer, a subunit. Right? A nucleotide, a monosaccharide, or an amino acid. Those are the subunits. Fats, lipids, do not have specific subunits. They don't join together into big, long strings. A fatty acid has a glycerol head and a fatty acid group off to the side. Maybe three fatty acid groups. That's called a triglyceride. Inside a cell membrane, you have what's called a phospholipid. We'll get to that when we talk about cells. That's the big take home. You can get calories from four things and four things only. Carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids or fatty acids. That's it. And the other stuff that you need, the inorganic substances, you need those for all, all the other things. You must have sodium ion, potassium ion, calcium ions, uh, chloride ions. You have to have those things. But you cannot get calories from those things. They just help you to get calories. Uh, pH, we went through the pH scale. Remember, the lower the number on the pH scale, the more acid that solution is. The higher the number on the pH scale, 
the less acid it is, or we would say that's a more alkaline, alkaline solution or a more basic solution. You got to practice this stuff. You got to get used to that. I know this is a long video, but this is really basic stuff that is essential to understand in order to move forward. Thanks for your attention. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to post this up as soon as I can. Enjoy your day.